Another example of how to do a physics problem involving the, the concepts of work, energy, and power. And again, I'm going to use this handy equation to solve any of these types of problems. So here's another good example for that. Uh, the problem here says uh, a 20 kilogram crate slides down an incline starting at a height of 10 meters and making an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal. If the coefficient of friction is 0.1, what will be the speed of the crate at the bottom of the hill? So you say, wow, how do I do that? Well, you know you're going to use this handy equation that says that any work put into the system plus any initial potential energy that you had plus any initial kinetic energy that you had equals the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy plus any heat lost to the system. And remember, what we're looking for is the velocity or speed at the bottom of the hill, so V final is equal to question mark, that's what we're after. And to get a more, a better visual picture of what's happening here, let's make a, a drawing, a sketch. So let's say we have a, an incline, like so. The incline makes an angle theta equal to 30 degrees. Let's say the crate starts at the top of the hill, or the top of the incline. And let's say that the height is equal to 10 meters. The crate has a mass of 20 kilograms. And it's going to slide all the way down to the very bottom. And uh, let's see here. We do have friction, so let's mark that. So mu is equal to 0 0.1. And uh, that definitely is going to play a role because if there's friction there, that means that some of the energy lost uh, is uh, lost by overcoming the friction. Let's now plug in at least all the things that we know so far. So the crate starts from, presumably from rest, so you just kind of let it go. The crate begins to slide down. And so nobody's pushing the crate, no force is applied to make the, for the crate go down. So we can say that there's zero work input. The initial poten potential energy is there because it started from an initial height. So we can say that it's equal to mgh. That's the definition of potential energy. And kinetic energy wise, assuming that the crate started from rest, kinetic energy initially would be equal to zero. Now when the crate reaches the bottom of the hill, there's then zero height right here, that's our reference height, so there would be no potential energy at the end, so that would be zero, plus kinetic energy we presume it would have, assuming that the friction is not too great so that the crate will actually slide down the hill and gain speed, we could then say that the kinetic energy at the end would be one half mv squared. Now, if you end up with a negative answer for the velocity, that would be a really good indication that uh, there's too much friction and the crate wouldn't slide in the first place. But I don't think that's going to be the case here. And let's put a V sub F down so to indicate that's the final velocity. And then the heat lost is the heat or the energy lost uh, by overcoming friction. So that would be equal to uh, the friction force times the distance that the crate slides down the hill. So we know the mass, we know the height, we don't know the final velocity, which is what we're looking for, but we also need to know the distance the crate slides down and what the friction force is equal to. So let's go ahead and try to figure that out first before we can solve the whole problem. So we have the weight of the crate, which is straight down, mg, which can then be written into the perpendicular component and the horizontal component relative to the incline. The perpendicular component would be mg cosine theta because this angle here, theta, is the same as this angle, theta, right there. And then the horizontal component is mg sine theta. That's the force that's pulling the crate down the incline. We then have a corresponding normal force, a force pushing back from the incline this way, which is a normal force. And the normal force is always equal and opposite to the component of the weight that's perpendicular to the incline. So that means that the normal force is equal to mg cosine theta. And then we have a friction force. And since the crate is sliding down the hill to the right, the friction force would then be in the opposite direction, opposing that motion, the friction force. And the friction force would be equal to the normal force times mu. And the normal force, of course, is mg cosine theta. Which means when we plug that back into our equation here, we can say that on the left side, we simply have an mgh. The zeros are gone. And on the right side, we have a 1 half 
mv final squared plus the friction force, which is the normal force times mu. And since the normal force is mg cosine theta, we can write this as mg cosine theta, which is the normal force, times mu. And then we have to multiply times the distance. Now, before I plug in the distance there, maybe we can figure out what the distance is. Because that's this displacement or distance right here. And that's part of this triangle right here. So we have a triangle. Let me redraw that here. Here's a triangle with the angle theta here. The theta is 30 degrees. We have the opposite side to the angle, which is height equals to 10 meters. And then we have the hypotenuse, which is d. And using trigonometry, we know that the opposing side, h, is equal to the hypotenuse d times the sine of the angle theta. Sine because it's opposite to the angle. And so we can use this equation to solve for d. So therefore, d is equal to h divided by the sine of theta. And so that will then go into our equation here. Instead of d, we'll write it's equal to h divided by the sine of theta. Now we're ready to solve the problem. Uh, maybe not yet, because what I think we should do is solve this equation for the variable we're looking for first. So that means I'm going to write this on the left side, write this on the right side. Basically, I'm going to turn the equation around, and I'm going to move this portion of the equation to the other side. So we have 1 half mv squared. So when we move this over to the left side, and then we move this to the right side, and then we change the signs. So we have 1 half mv squared equals mgh. And of course, when we move this to the other side, that becomes minus mg cosine of theta times mu times h over sine of theta. Now, that makes a lot of sense because if we didn't have friction, we just end up with this portion of the equation where the final kinetic energy equals the initial potential energy. But what's different in this case is that we also lose some energy due to the friction. And this is the energy term or the portion of the energy lost due to friction. So we have to subtract that from the initial potential energy. Now, simplifying this a little bit more, I realize that every term in the equation has an m in it, the mass. So that cancels out. We can cancel out an m on both sides. And isolating for v final, we can multiply both sides by 2. So we can say that v final squared is equal to 2gh minus 2g cosine of theta times mu times h over sine of theta. And then looking at the right side, I can see that a 2 is common, g is common, and h is common. So all that can be factored out. So v final squared is equal to 2gh times 1 minus the 2gh is gone. So we have a cosine of theta times mu divided by the sine of theta, like so. And then finally, to find v final, we have to take the square root of both sides. So v final is equal to the square root of 2gh times 1 minus the cosine of theta times mu divided by the sine of theta. Now here's something very interesting. Remember that we did a problem before where we did not have any friction, which means this term didn't exist. And the answer was that the final velocity of something coming down a hill, sliding down a hill, or rolling down a hill with no friction is simply the square root of 2gh. But since there's friction, we have this additional term. So plugging in the values, this is equal to the square root of 2 times g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, times h, which is 10 meters. So now we have this portion of the, of the equation. And now we multiply this whole thing by 1 minus the cosine of 30 degrees divided by the sine of 30 degrees times mu, which is 0.1 in this case. There we go. And now when we grab a calculator, we can find out what the final result is. So we take the cosine of 30 divided by the sine of 30. We multiply that times 0.1. And we subtract that from 1. And we multiply that times 2 times 9.8 and times 10. And now we take the square root of, both of that whole thing, square root, and we get 12.7. So the final velocity in this case 
is 12.7 meters per second. Okay, so you can see again that by using this equation, which applies to many of these types of situations, you can solve for almost anything you want. All right, trying to show you how that's true. Let me show you another example that will use that very same equation to solve for the answer. 